Uh, my name is James. This week, the theme that we're looking at is dangerous games. We're returning to dangerous games that we looked at in our virtual reality series. Uh, and this week, it's dangerous voluntary games. People are taking part in these games of their own free will with a little bit of uh, arm twisting, maybe. So what films are we looking at to discuss these dangerous games, James? Well, we've got more ultra violence for you this week. We are looking at Rollerball from 1975. And also from 1975, we're looking at Death Race 2000. So yeah, lots of violent, blood splattering action, sports galore. These kind of sports you do not want to play, or maybe you do want to play, depending on your uh, state of mind and body. (laughs) And joining us this week to discuss those two films, we're very excited to be joined by Kevin Lyons, film reviewer, film historian extraordinaire and proprietor of the Encyclopedia of Fantastic Film and Television, EOFFTV. Yes, very excited to chat to Kev on the show. It's our second guest of the series. So yeah, very much up for discussing these two ultra-violent films with him. So should we get Kev on and get started with these films then, James? Yeah, I'm going to strap on my spiked gloves my roller skates, get on that rollerball rink and skate my way around this conversation with Kevin Lyons. So we have the pleasure of being joined on the podcast today with the walking, talking encyclopedia of fantastic film and television. It's the one, the only Kevin Lyons. Kev, how are you doing? I'm doing very well, thank you. How about yourselves? Not bad at all. Not bad at all. Good, good. Very excited to get into this chat. Yeah, I'm very pleased to be here. We're going to talk about a couple of my favourite films. So, you know, what not to love. Yes, we're navigating uh, dystopian stories, uh, this this series on, on Journey Through Sci-Fi. Uh, why do you think dystopian stories in particular are, are so engaging? I think, I mean, you know, this is not a particularly original observation, but I think it allows us to rehearse for things. It allows us to sort of... We all have, have at the back of, my, of our minds, we all kind of think this is coming, this is what, you know, the, these futures that we read about and that we watch, we think they're coming. So this allows us to rehearse for them. I had these conversations with several of my friends who are, like me, of a certain age and grew up in the 1970s, watching things like Survivors and reading John Wyndham and how kind of disappointed we were when the pandemic arrived because we'd already kind of rehearsed for it. And it wasn't the collapse of civilization that we were told it was going to be. It turned out to be something a little bit different it turned out to be sitting on the sofa watching netflix which was not quite (laughs) as exciting thankfully as something like survivors so i think what it does i think it allows us to rehearse for um rehearse for the unthinkable allows us to think the unthinkable um we look at the future it's very uncertain no one knows where it's going particularly at the moment there's been i think a bit of an upsurge in interest particularly among younger readers Uh, in dystopian fiction and I think you know when you look at the world around us at the moment we're living in a kind of dystopian future as it is so I think you know yeah why why would you not want to read fictional versions of it to help you understand a little bit better perhaps what's going on in the real world that's a really interesting take on it does it also then allow the kind of worst people of society to also rehearse and the potential tyrants out there to to get a leg up of course it does. Yeah, I mean, all those uh, those people in, um, I'm not picking on you, America, but you do seem to have a lot of them. Those people who go up to the hills with their guns and everything, I'm, I'm sure they've read all these books and seen all these films. And, you know, you and I and everybody else, we see them and read them as a kind of, you know, a cautionary tale. They see them as an instruction manual, which, you know, is inevitable. That's going to happen, which is not to say that we shouldn't have dystopian fiction why not it's you know it's uh yeah i think it just helps us through our fears you know it really does you look at it you think well actually the world today is not as bad as it is here it could be worse and then you look at it you think how would i cope in a world like that what you know would i survive a world like that yeah that could be worse aspect kind of cuts that cuts through the horror sometimes and you were talking um you you mentioned uh, a minute ago about um sort of like these two films being like obviously they're from the 70s there's sort of like you remember them coming out what's your sort of like relationship to to these two in particular like rollerball and death race 2000 what do you remember about them well i saw both of them on double bills funnily oh, enough wow. um death race 2000 i saw on um a double bill with it was enter the dragon oh, amazing one of my faves Th- that was a night out to remember wasn't it and I was only 15, but it's not obvious from from here and certainly won't be to your listeners, but I'm quite tall and I've been quite tall since I was 14. And I think they just didn't want to 
argue with me. <laughs> so I was able to get into X films fairly early on when I shouldn't have done. And this double bill was one of my my early ones. And uh, Rollerball, I saw a really strange double bill. There was a there was a thing in the seventies where films from earlier in the decade would then get repackaged as double bills, often in very, very unlikely pairings, really, really strange, you know, setups. And I saw Rollerball with Juggernaut, which is that film um, Richard Lester made about the blackmailer um, planting bombs on an ocean liner. Ah. I mean, they're quite mismatched. <laughs> There's not a lot of action in Juggernaut. The only good thing about it is, and I, I, I'm denied about whether to tell this story, you have to remember I was 15. Me and my friends did come up with a whole sort of thing about roll your balls and juggle your nuts, which of course was, you know, is what you do when you're 14. So that was, I suspect somebody somewhere in, in Wardour Street actually put these films together thinking, you know, there's an awful lot of idiot bloody kids out there who are going to make this joke. Let's do it because it was, you know, free publicity. But yes, that was, um, I mean, to this day, I had to think just now when I said juggernaut, I had to actually have a split second thought and not say, you know, what I said when I was back at the time. But, but there you are. So yes, I saw them both on double bills and they they eventually they did the rounds together as a double bill sometime later and certainly back then i was at the cinema two or three times a week so it's very likely i don't remember it specifically but i i suspect i went to see both of them again on that double bill which again would have been quite the night yeah. out i think i think like um because sci-fi and sort of like horror as well all those kind of like genre films they lend themselves to this sort of a uh, double billing and i think oh yes yeah and these two films in particular like you were saying they are very connected they came out the same year they're both about the same sort of thing um they're both dystopian i think yeah i think it's 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 no surprise that they came out like that yeah and Death Race 2000 does owe its existence a little to the success of Rollerball. You know, they they may have made it without Rollerball, but it's unlikely. I think, you know, the, the fact that Rollerball existed was what made Roger Corman think, we'll have some of that. We'll, we'll invent our own death sport and we'll we'll go for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would make sense. A very old school uh, mockbuster. It, it is. It almost is like the, the sort of modern day mockbusters, although, of course, it's a far better version. That, I mean, I think... When um, when they did the remake of uh, Death Race 2000, I've got a feeling that um, the Asylum did actually do their own mockbuster, but for the life of me, I can't think what it is, and I'm not going to waste brain cells trying to rattle that one out of my memory because I mean it, it's bound to be bloody awful, isn't it? So, uh, but you know, at least Death Race 2000 was a proper film. They were actually trying to do something clever and different and original with it, and they succeeded in that. Absolutely no problem. And of course, Rollerball was remade as well, wasn't it, in the 2000s? I was hoping we were going to mention that. <laughs> we'll get, yeah, we'll get um, it over with now, Kev, so we don't have to mention it. Let's get it out of the way, okay. shall we? Yeah, well, yeah. it's one of those sort of remakes. Well, I'm not a great fan of remakes, but, you know, sometimes you just look at them and you think, really? What were you thinking? They take virtually all of the science fiction out of it. It's set vaguely in the very near future. And Rollerball isn't rollerball anymore it's something else and i'm not quite sure what it is to be fair i only watched it the once and vowed never to see it again it is sitting on the shelf somewhere behind me amongst all my dvds and i'm, I'm probably never going to watch it i didn't even watch it for this which shows my commitment really doesn't it so uh... <laughs> <laughs> well i don't blame you at all kev so so let's talk about rollerball then what is it about this film and sort of like what what is rollerball first off what's what's the premise <laughs> Jonathan E, that's the name. Houston players come and go, but the champion plays on. You know how the game serves us. It has a definite social purpose. Nations are bankrupt, gone. No poverty, no sickness. Man has accomplished what he'd always craved. Corporate society was an inevitable destiny, a good life, a centuries-old dream. You better do as you're told, Jonathan. That's all I have to say. Rollerball is a futuristic sport, which is something like a sort of an unholy cross between ice hockey, basketball, speedway, and a bit of martial arts. 
And that doesn't even come close to explaining what rollerball actually is. It's this incredibly violent game, which I mean, the rules, there were actually proper rules that were laid out in a press book that came out at the time incredibly complicated rules go and look them up they're online you can now find them. go look for rollerball um roller, rollerball game whatever and it'll give you all the all the rules that you need to know but basically it's a circular track and it's two teams and these teams represent cities that are now run by huge corporations so our hero of the piece and the fact that he is the hero of the piece is vital to the story is jonathan e played by james khan he plays for houston who are run by Energy, which is this big global energy corporation. And the idea is that a metal ball gets fired around this circular track. According to the press book, it comes out at up to 135 miles an hour, which makes one particular shot where the ball collides with an unconscious man absolutely unbearable once you figure that out. It then flies around the track. There's a single goal. It's a magnetic hole in the wall. And you've got seven skaters and three motorcyclists and they just hair around the track, knocking seven sorts of whatever out of each other for possession of the ball, and it's whoever gets the ball. And there's, there's no subtlety to roll a ball. Even before, as the film goes along, we'll talk about this in a moment, they change the rules to make it more violent. But even the first game that we see, we see three games in the film, and even the first game is pretty eye-watering in its violence. In normal sports, sort of physical contact is not really condoned too much it's the whole point of rollerball you know you have to hurt the opposition to get them out of the way because they're not going to they're not going to sort of stop there and be nice to you you have to run them over and do all sorts of horrible things to each other so it's a very very violent game where physical contact is actively encouraged i did notice that through through that first game yeah it is very violent but it kind of uh it gets more violent as that scene goes on isn't it it's kind of introduced and it's a pretty cool it it doesn't even look that futuristic it looks like a you know fairly fairly cool trendy sport that's just been invented but it's like as we get through the montage with that scene then the blood starts to spill more and more and it just gets more and more vicious and what's so clever about it is that first scene sets up the rules quite economically yeah. there's no sort of, no you don't have someone stopping there like a television reporter explaining the rules to you know a worldwide audience who already know how the game works it's just the, the, the information is leaked to us but it's time through the first game which as you say it becomes more and more violence as it goes along and then we have two more games each one be more violent than the last. So it sort of builds up this huge crescendo of violence, which is really part of what the film is about, this idea of using violence as an entertainment and a way of placating people. It was um, it's based on a short story called Rollerball Murder by a guy called William Harrison, and he was partly inspired by having gone to an ice hockey match and being quite staggered by not only the violence on the rink, where the, you know, so the, 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 the teams were kind of less interested in getting that puck into the into the goal than actually hurting each other. But the, the response of the audience who were egging them on, he it, it, it felt like it was a bit gladiatorial. And he, he did what all good science fiction writers... He wasn't a science fiction writer. This was his only genre piece. But he does what all good science fiction writers do. They look at something and say, what if? How far can I push this to make this something interesting? And that's how we ended up with the short story Rollerball Murder and the film, which is actually surprisingly quite close to the uh, the short story. Well, he, he adapted his own screenplay, didn't he? So he's very- He did. Indeed, he did, yeah. And um, there are some changes. The game is a little bit more fanciful in the short story. There are multiple balls in play at any one time. So, you know, absolute mayhem right from the start. <laughs> and I think stripping it down was very wise because then that allowed that sort of crescendo of violence that I was talking about. You said earlier that like the, the rules are explained very economically at the, at the beginning and that's that's interesting that they've simplified it as well for the film because there's a weird sort of tension in the film which is that obviously the film is very critical of violence in sport and the obsession with violence in sport of course but rollerball the sport is cool it looks great those three <laughs> scenes are exciting and fun it's it's brilliant, isn't it? Do you know what? As an idiotic fifteen-year-old, I was I was out in the cul-de-sac where I lived. You know, so with, with a pair of roller skates, which I suspect I stole from my sister because I don't remember having <laughs> roller skates. And back and back then, every every kid had a bike with one of those luggage racks on the back. So of course, we were all holding onto these luggage racks on roller skates, nearly breaking our necks trying to recreate rollerball. Oh my god, street, that's amazing! You know? that's because amazing. that's what you did. You know, it was it, you were just idiots. And it turns out that actually the the stunt people 
the stuntmen on the on the film were actually playing rollerball between takes when they first started shooting it the, the rules weren't that well codified they were kind of making them up as they went along and part of that was down to the fact that the stuntmen in their downtime well you know it wasn't bad enough that they're out there being knocked about you know for their day job they thought we'll go out and do this again and they were inventing a lot of the tactics and the rules as they went along during the games so um it, you can see why it's so you know so so sort of seductive really as a sport you know even for someone who's not sporty like me at all i think you know if, if i wasn't 59 year 59 years old overweight and chronically out of condition i think i'd have a go at rock <laughs> the ball it does look like a lot of ridiculous fun <laughs> Well, it's like I kept thinking of um, roller derby as well. I don't know if you guys have yes. seen much of that. It's very close yes. to roller derby, which is an actual sport. Of course, I hadn't thought of that. But yes, you're absolutely right. Yes, it is, isn't it? And there, there, wasn't there a film around that time as well yeah. about roller derby? I can't remember what it was called. Yeah, but... the only one that I remember about roller derby is, I think it's Whip It. I think it's called. It's got That's, Elliot Page. That was later. Yeah, yeah, I think there was one in the 70s. I've got a feeling that Wonder Woman was in it. What's her name? The original Wonder Woman. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. Um, oh, her name's gone right in my head. But yes. <laughs> Linda Carter? That's her. Well, how did I? How did a man of my age forget Linda Carter's name? Good <laughs> God. But yeah, I, I've got a feeling she might have been in it, though I could be completely wrong. But there, uh, there was an earlier uh, film about Roller Derby, which was one of those, again, one of those strangely American things that didn't really take off over here. You know, you never really saw it much. You, it may have been played occasionally in various places, but you never really saw it. You never saw it on television over here or anything and it kind of died out fairly quickly in america I, I think all the roller things died out very quickly there was roller disco for a while god help us but um <laughs> i've never heard of roller derby it is all very it it does all feel very american and that's sort of the point of the film isn't it like i was really interested you mentioned that um what's his name william harrison the the author yeah uh, that, that he was actually inspired by hockey ice hockey because I, as as a Brit, I don't know if you guys feel the same way. I, I just don't know a lot about ice hockey. It's not a thing over here. But no. the violence is the thing that I'm aware of. That's what's bled through into culture to me. It's a violent sport. I'm exactly the same. I'm sure that there are all kinds of nuances in the game, that there are all kinds of skills and tactics. But whenever I think ice hockey, I think, yeah, you know, sort of people being rammed into those sort of surrounds, you yes, know, those exactly, glass surrounds yeah. and fights breaking out. That's what occurs to me i'm sure the good people of canada where it is hugely popular will be sitting there yeah. now throwing things <laughs> yeah. at their at their screens you know <laughs> you you idiot brit you know nothing about this but that's the public image that has sort of transferred over here and you know maybe something like rollerball didn't help because you know we make that subconscious connection with it perhaps well Who maybe I, but i thought i was just being biased because that's what i know of ice hockey but it's sort of it's that's why it's so interesting that that actually was his inspiration it's like oh okay it yes. sounds like it is yeah. as violent yeah. as i've as i've uh, oh yeah i mean is. yeah i mean you've only got to go on youtube yeah. and just type in ice hockey clashes and you you know it's not about the games it, it's about a little bit like rollerball in a way rollerball eventually becomes not about the game and I yeah. do sometimes wonder if ice hockey is still about the game or whether it's about the violence, you know? Yeah, exactly. And it's, it's so interesting, this film as well, because they are, the whole idea is they're commercialising this violence, aren't they? And it's becoming like a consumerist product that they're, yeah. they're putting out. And so sort of like just to, talking about sort of like the setup of the world of Rollerball, because it is a dystopian society, isn't it? You've got the corporations who are in charge, like any sort of like cyberpunk story or something like that it's the corporations that are in control so what did you guys think of like the actual setup of the world and sort of having these corporations call all the shots i do wonder if you know sort of people like william gibson and bruce sterling saw the film because you know certainly in the in the um in the Gibson novels, the Zaibatsus are not that dissimilar. And you've got those, um, I think they're called e economic Democrats or democratic economists or something that you've got in Islands in the Nest by Bruce Sterling. Mm. So, you know, they, they, they were doing this idea of, sort of the world being run by big corporations. Perhaps there was just something in the air at the time. I think, you know, by the mid-70s, we'd started to question the power of, of big corporations. At one time, they seemed like, you know, they were these che cheery chaps who were selling us various products that we may or may not have needed. And then I think we sort of reached a point where they started to look a little bit sinister. And so they became really useful villains for dystopian science fiction. I mean, in this one, you have got these sort of huge corporations, which we think are working together. It, they appear to be working together. At one point, Mr. Bartholomew, who's kind of the, the villain of the piece, John Houseman, he has a, a video conference with 
various heads of other corporations, and they're deciding Jonathan E.'s fate during this call. So they're clearly all working together, but the film leaves us just a little bit of wriggle room. We don't quite know how closely they're working together. There's talk of corporate wars having taken place at some point in the past. And, you know, that again is slightly glossed over because there is a thread in the film about them trying to erase history or alter history. So they know about the corporate wars, but no one seems to be able to explain what they were or who won, if anybody won at all. Sweet dreams, Moonpie. <laughs> it's a bad habit you got there. You know what that habit will make you dream, Moon Pie? You'll dream you're an executive. You'll have your hands on all the controls, and you'll wear a gray suit, and you'll make decisions. But you know what, Moon Pie? You know what those executives dream about out there behind their desks? They dream they're great rollerballers. Yeah. They dream they're Jonathan. They have muscles. They bash in faces. So, yeah, you've got this sort of strange world where the government isn't mentioned once in Rollerball. There's no mention of anything, of any American government or any global government. Everything is the corporations. And they've politicised the game as well because it's, it's a bit like, you know, sort of a futuristic version of the old bread and circuses thing, isn't it? You know, if we can mm, keep them placated yeah. with violence, give them what they want, they're not going to ask any questions. They're going to... We'll make, we'll make this game as violent as possible and whip up this sort of frenzy of patriotism for a corporation... You know, they've got their own hymns. They sing these corporate hymns, which are dreadful dirges, which is probably pretty much what you would imagine. You know, they, they, a corporation would hire the, the, the lowest paid musician they could find just to come up with some awful piece of music. So they all sort of stand to attention during the corporate hymn, you know, which is it's actually quite funny. I, I find those scenes quite amusing because I think they're meant to be funny, you know. But, um, yeah, so you've got this sort of really weird world, which is run, being run by the corporations, but they're, they're trying to corporatize everything so they want everybody to not be an individual to all pull together and be part of a team and this is where it becomes a very sort of american thing i don't think you could have made this anywhere else but america in 1975 it was you know this idea of the the you know the hardy individual fighting back against the man you know and that's a very prevalent theme even today that you still see that in in fact most dystopian futures i think revolve or, the, or certainly the good ones revolve around that lone hero you know, sort of battling against the odds. You, you think of things like Mad Max or Blade Runner, you know, where you've got this lone figure sort of kicking against the authorities to sort of fight back. And that's what we've got with Jonathan. He's become an inadvertent hero. He didn't set out to be a hero. And what's interesting about him, I don't think he's political. I've yeah. never thought of Jonathan E as being political. I think it's just an accident that he was just very good at rollerball. So he's become this thing that the corporations fear the most a dogged individual who just keeps winning no matter what they do to him. And that frightens them because they don't want people to be seeing themselves as individuals. But I don't think he doesn't have a particularly political viewpoint on anything yeah. in the I think, film. I think that's what's so fascinating about him, isn't it? Because he's sort of like he gets his individualism from playing rollerball and he says he loves playing the game. He's yeah. all about that. Yeah. And suddenly he's he's his own person. Everyone's calling his name. The other teams yep. are calling his name. Yes. And then suddenly he gets the recognition. And so much of dystopia we've looked at so far on the series is talking about like dehumanization and sure. taking away from the individual. Where, yeah. Whereas when Jonathan's playing, he is the star, isn't he? He is the star. Of course he is. He's the big celebrity, you know. And this is something that terrifies the corporations because that's not... In fact, they explicitly sort of spell this out throughout the film that this is not what the the game was for you know you can bartholomew tells um jonathan at one point you know how the game serves us it's a definite social purpose you know it's not just a game he points out that no player is greater than the game itself mm. and that's where he becomes this danger you know and it, uh, towards the end when they've um they scrapped all the rules pretty much and you know the houston captain tells uh, one of his one of his assistants this was never meant to be a game you know the the final match in particular isn't a game it's a political it's a political coup against one man 
which is really bizarre. That one man element of it is great. Bartholomew is great because it is it is kind of about a, a faceless corporation, but it's not a faceless corporation. They've given that faceless corporation a face. Yeah, and it's John Houseman who's this nice, cuddly old man, you know. So, the, and again, that's so cynical, isn't it? That they they put and you know, there's a scene near the beginning, isn't it, when he goes to see the team. Uh, in the dressing room afterwards, and they're all sort of, oh, look, you know, it's, it's Mr. Bartholomew, oh, look, and he's so lovely and so nice, and he's not, he's horrible. He's a really, really nasty yeah, piece of work yeah. who's prepared to murder people just to get rid of Jonathan, because that's what that last game is, that the, the final game that we sort of see right at the end of the film. It's not sport anymore. It is the murder part of rollerball murder, and, you know, it's a political assassination just disguised as a game of rollerball. Yeah. And I mean, the corporations take control of their lives in every aspect, don't they? I mean, oh, yeah. You've got like this sort of like everyone's, all of the rollerball players are made to be celebrities. There's a celebrity culture around everything. But yep. there's, there's also this thing about like the, the, the relationships they're in, the relationships they have with one another. They're all manufactured and it is like a manufactured celebrity culture. And of course it is, yeah. Yeah. And especially Jonathan E's relationships, like he loses his wife and to a find corporate about, head. Yeah. To a corporate executive. They the corporate executive takes her away because he wants her. And yeah. that's the power they've got over them. You know, he can't even stay with his wife because, you know, some, some suit decides that I want her now. So that's you know, and his only friends are people either on the team like Moon Pie, poor old Moon Pie, you know, oh, one of the most Moon tragic Pie. figures in, in 70s science fiction. I'm, that's I watched it again this afternoon before recording this, and that scene always upsets me when Moon Pie meets his end. It is it's so horrible. Sorry if I'm it spoiling it for anybody, but, you know, it, it's, it's horrible. But, you know, he, his only other friend is Cletus, who was his former um, trainer, who's now a corporate executive. Mm. He doesn't have friends outside of this little world. There are people out there. But he's not allowed to mix with them or he doesn't know how to mix with them because they're not part of this sort of corporate, very structured world that he lives in. It's a very interesting way of doing the world building, isn't it? Through Jonathan E's experiences of the corporations, like you said. So what we know about his friendships tells us a lot about what friendship might be like in the world of Rollerball. But we just get this drip feeding of, of world building through Jonathan E's experiences. And I, I loved it because it was one of those things that left me really wanting more. I I want to know more about the corporate wars, but you can't know because it's been erased from history. So they can't tell that story. And it's quite clever, I think, because too often you can get an awful lot of backstory, which then falls apart. When you start thinking about the backstories, it kind of falls apart. They very cleverly left just enough wriggle room in the film for us to think about what, how did we get here? What's going And there's little bits in it. That's, I love this one scene. And I know... You know, everybody goes on that the rollerball scenes are the best in it and the the bits off the rollerball track are a bit boring. Nonsense. They're great. There's a wonderful sequence in there where he goes to a party. Jonathan goes to a party. Yes, I Uh, love that sequence. It's fantastic, isn't it? While he's having this argument with Bartholomew, the rest of the guests, who are all sort of smacked out of their heads on these sort of corporate-sanctioned drugs... The, the, the ennui that has settled onto their society means that the only thing they can think to do is go outside and shoot some trees. <laughs> mm. That's all they can think to do because they've had everything else taken away from them. And even in a drugged up state, that's, that's all they can come up with. And that says so much more about the world than if someone had given some big, you know, five minute lecture in the middle of it, you know. It's so subtle and so clever. The, the combinations of, of like shock and distress and also excitement and enjoyment on their faces when they're doing that and shooting those trees yeah and he's so petty yeah it's so yeah. petty when you've got a guy in the house behind you who puts his life on the line every time he play and this is the most excitement that they can come up with like you say they're like little children at christmas aren't they their faces light up because we've blown up a tree yeah what are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> What's the point? What's gone wrong with your lives, you know? And it's such a subtle thing, but it tells you so much about the world in which, you know, we're temporarily living for a couple of hours. Yeah, yeah because it told it told it tells a lot about sort of like the technology they have as well, because you don't see too yeah. much of that technology. But they talk about how there's no wars, there's no sort of like poverty yeah. because of the corporations, yeah. but they have this technology that could 
decimate cities from the looks of it. Oh, easily. Yeah. I mean, they could, that, that, that small band of, you know, sort of coked up party goers could start the Third World War. But <laughs> I don't <laughs> think they've got what it takes to do that, thankfully. I just don't think they'd have the imagination to do anything like that. And that's, you know, that, that suits the corporations because they've, while they're politicising the game rollerball, they've depoliticised the world of rollerball. No one cares anymore. They're apathetic. They're bored. They're useless. They're just, you know, they they are the perfect corporate employees and the perfect corporate population because they're just not going to argue with anybody, which makes the whole thing about Jonathan trying to find out about the past, you know, wanting to read books. Again, that's a very subtle bit of business that he decides to go at one point to go and try and read some books. And Moonpie can't get his head round it. Moonpie doesn't understand this at all. He's his best mate. And he's like, well, what do you want to read books for? You know. <laughs> and then when he gets to the library, he finds out that books have been digitised. I mean, this sounds terribly familiar, doesn't it? But they've also <laughs> they've also been edited, and mm. you know there are bits missing out of the story. So they've lost a whole century. They've got this computer called Zero, which is run by the librarian, played by Ralph Richardson, and they've lost the 13th century. There's no history from the 13th century. Although the librarian librarian doesn't seem to care, he's got that wonderful line, it wasn't a very good century, just Dante and a few corrupt popes. (laughs) (laughs) Wonderful line. But, but, you know, that's the world they've got, that they don't care about the past. So, you know, they've sort of made this token effort to create this library in, in the form of Zero, the computer, which is then just useless at its job. And I don't know, and again, this is a very clever part about the film, I don't know if they're deliberately rewriting the past or this is just ineptitude, that they've just, you know, they've gone again for the lowest bidder for this IT system, which has then got corrupted and it's lost, and they just don't care. You know, I don't know whether it's a deliberate rewriting. I mean, we see enough of that now, don't we? We only only have to look at corporations and governments now to realise that actually there is no conspiracy, they're just inept. They're just rubbish. <laughs> you know, they, they, they wouldn't have the brains to come up with a conspiracy. And I think, you know, that's possibly what we're seeing in this world. It sort of seems on the surface to be running smoothly, but you get these little clues that actually it's not really. They're just not very good at it. It's sort of it's being held together on a wing of the prayer, really. I think there's a combination of those two sort of possibilities, isn't there? Because, yeah. like, certainly Jonathan cannot get any information on the corporate wars. That's been that's been erased. They don't want that knowledge out there. I think the 13th century thing is there to just tell you that it's, it's both things as well. It's, it's both it's, things that things yes, aren't yeah. run well, and we'll lose a whole century. But we will also erase things deliberately. Like erase the things wars. as well, and it suits them to be able to say, "Oh, the computer system's unreliable. We've lost the 13th century. Oh, look, we've lost the corporate." Yeah. Wars as well. Yeah. Oh dear, what a shame. Never mind. Let's move on because we've got rollerball. Mm. You don't have to ask a question because, you know, Houston are going to play, you know, New York next week. So why worry about it? You yeah. Know? It reminded me of the of the kind of the the Aldous Huxley, George Orwell um debate. Yes. That we, we talked about that a couple of episodes ago. And this is this is a society where, yes, they are erasing history, but people don't really know or care because they're so placated by the violence course, and the yeah. drugs and the opulence yeah. that most people, unlike Jonathan, are not out there trying to get books about the corporate wars. They just don't care. They want to shoot trees. They just don't care, yeah. It's just they've got everything they think they need, so why would they go looking for anything else, you know? And that's that's the danger, I think. You know, to, It isn't revolution that we need to be scared of. It's apathy, I think. You know, that we slide into these things because we're just apathetic and we let them happen and we don't care. And, you know, you can see that happening all around the world, you know. OK, I'm a grumpy old man now, so I tend to see these things <laughs> everywhere. But, you know, you, you do sort of see this sort of apathy in the world. You think, oh, we've got to do something. Otherwise, we are going to be living in a world of rollerball, you know. But then we get a cool game to watch. <laughs> <laughs> then we get a cool game to watch. So who's complaining? Yeah, and you know, maybe I can be the oldest, fattest rollerball player in the world. Yeah, try and try knocking me off my feet when I'm this weight. Yeah, we, that's we a good idea. We could all have a new career ahead of us in the rollerball world. <laughs> oh god, I don't think I would last ten seconds on yeah, a rollerball. I was going to say, field. I think it could be very short. To be honest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good point. Good point. I probably would go watch it. To be fair, I'm not sure that reflects well on me, but I think I would go watch <laughs> rollerball. <laughs> It'd be the sick curiosity of it, wouldn't it? You'd of like, course, you'd want to know. Yeah. Oh, you'd yeah. want to know. It's like, it is the car crash thing, isn't it? You'd want to go along just to see what someone being killed in rollerball would look like. Yeah. And also it's it's kind of like the whole society is kind of emotionless in that way as well yes. because they're watching these games, but they're so disconnected from what's actually happening. They just cheer. And like it's the same with the players as well. None of the players are showing 
much sort of compassion no. for one another or anything. It's just like, again, it's the dehumanization. They're all just taken away from their emotions. There's one very brief scene. And again, it's an absolutely wonderful piece just before the third and final game. At this point, the rules have been thrown out. No substitutions, uh, no time limits, and just, just no, no limits on anything, to be honest. You just keep going. It's, it's, it's to the death in the third third one. And there's a very wonderful little scene of the Houston players just sitting in the dressing room before they go out and they're not talking to each other. Mm, they're yeah. not looking at each other because they know that they're not coming back. You know, this is the end for them. And they've realised that they, they've, you know, they, they probably realised far too late that they really are pawns in this awful game that they didn't even understand they were playing. You know, there was another game going on beyond rollerball that they knew no- nothing about. It feels like gladiators in the pits before before they Oh, definitely. Out, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, like I said earlier, you know, it's, it is that sort of bread and circuses thing. It is distract the masses with the blood sports so that they don't ask too many questions. It's um, We've seen it before and I just hope we never see it again, you know. When this came out um, in 1975, had, had there been films like this? What would be the closest sort of comparison back then, do you reckon? I'm trying to think. I don't think they really had. I mean, you know, there'd been games about American football, which can be quite a, you know, sort of full, full on, full contact sport, but nothing quite like this, you know. And there have been dystopias, but I don't think one that had been quite as well worked out as this. There's a kind of iciness about this future, which I don't think we'd seen before. You know, you, I, I, it came out just before Logan's Run. And Logan's Run was kind of my idea of what film dystopias look like. Lots of people milling about in the background, wearing the same clothes, not actually going anywhere. They've ju- they're, they're only walking around because the assistant director told them to walk around. <laughs> in Rollerboard, you do get this sense that this is a real world and these are people, they're all wearing different clothes. They're, they seem to have a purpose. Even the background extras seem to have purpose. They're moving... You think they're going shopping or they're going to the office or whatever. Um, so in that sense, I don't think we'd seen anything before. It's certainly when I saw it back in whatever it was, 1977, on this double bill, I'd never seen anything like it at all. And I was absolutely heartbroken when over the years I started to read all these negative reviews about it because I thought, you know, is there something wrong with me? Because I thought that was so clever, the way they, they built this world and allowed me to fill in the gaps. That's what I liked about it the most, that it didn't dictate everything to me. It didn't hand it on a plate. He said, here you go, Kev, this is the world. This is what we're going to tell you about it. Now go away and make up the rest of yourself. And I love that. I'm surprised to hear that it that it did get bad reviews. This is this is, I've never seen it before. This is my first time watching it for the podcast. Right. And I, I, I loved it. The, the combination of yeah. that brilliant, subtle word, world building with really, really good action scenes that, that have a lot of like narrative and emotional heft behind them. It, I thought it was a just a brilliant film it's marvelous i mean it is absolutely one i think at the time you know it i mean you look at it and i was again was watching it this afternoon and you forget how violent it really is you know there's some really nasty stuff going on in it at 1975 i don't think we've seen anything quite like that in films um particularly what was meant to be a cerebral science fiction film you might have expected that, you know, coming from the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, but you didn't expect that in this game. Which, was, And let's face it, it was directed by Norman Jewison, who was a, a really sort of mainstream Hollywood director. Who'd be, you know, he'd, he'd never made anything like this before. So I think the critics saw it and thought, something's gone horribly wrong here. Why is this man <laughs> making this film that's so violent? And because it was so subtle as well, I don't think they got it. I think it's one of those films whose, whose time has come. I think, you know, audiences kind of appreciate it better because we appreciate the subtlety of it. And um, maybe, you know, for those of us who were reading tons of science fiction at the time, we kind of got that. But I think for a general audience, it was kind of a little bit too much. Yeah, I think that's it because it's not like, it's not full on satire, is it? It's not in your face American satire, is it? It's It's quite under the surface kind of stuff that's going on. Exactly. There's a subtlety to it which I think, you know, may have been its undoing at the time. It was too subtle. I think now it's it's just right. I always thought it was just right, but I think now other people, you know, it's found its audience, thankfully. I'm beginning to see a lot more love for it, which is marvellous. I don't feel quite so alone in it now. You know? <laughs> <laughs> rightfully so, Kev, rightfully so. Well, shall we move on to a much more in-your-face satirical film from the 1970s? Shall we talk about Death Race 2000 then? <laughs> 
we hope you're enjoying our discussion with Kev about rollerball listeners. If you want to hear more great content from us, then strap on those roller skates and skate your way over to patreon.com slash journey through sci-fi where you can sign up to support the show and if you sign up to the four pound level you'll get access to all our bonus episodes what sort of lovely episodes have we got over there james oh what haven't we got matt we've got so much content over there we've got sci-fi tv shows we cover over there we've got um things like we covered one division we've covered the foundation we've covered extra films we've covered classics like dark star there's so much stuff over there. It's even more fun than a deadly rollerblading, roller skating game full of violence. God, that, I mean, that makes it sound very exciting, James. If I wasn't already recording the episodes, I'd be skating on over there and signing up right away. Now let's get back to our conversation with Kev about Death Race 2000. The year 2000. America is a vast speedway. People line the streets to witness the greatest drivers on earth in a race from sea to shining sea. This is a death race. You finish first, or not at all. Death Race 2000. Every car a deadly weapon. Every spectator a potential point. It's a cross-country road wreck, and the traffic is murder. So, Kev, what are your experiences with this film? Well, just to pick on when you first put this ain't subtle. I mean, trust me, we, we, we're, not, we're not looking at nuance here. It's brilliant, but it's not subtle. Um, again, my first experience of it was it, it would see got on that double bill, and these, you know, this was one I was I was too young to go and see because it was an X certificate. Because you know there was whisper it don't tell anybody there were naked ladies in it oh my god <laughs> you know so 15 years old there's souped up cars there's mayhem there's blood there's violence and there's naked ladies i mean i'm first in the queue you know of course i am i'm 15 what else am i gonna do so yeah so i saw it on this double bill with um, enter the dragon i mean seriously i mean is it any any wonder i became a film fan how could you not see that on a saturday <laughs> night I mean, and not what think a combo. This is what I want to do with the rest of my life. I want to watch this stuff. You know, this is I mean, great. I've got a special relationship with this film because uh, my stepdad, when he was driving around, before I'd even seen the film, he would always go like, oh, that's X amount of points or that's this amount of points. Do you know what my dad did the my same? My parents yeah. did that as well. Yeah. yeah. I, and I, I've never seen this film before, so I didn't get the reference. My parents did that the whole my, my time. Dad did, my dad hadn't seen the film. He hadn't seen he, he saw it many years later on video, but he was still doing it. We'd be sitting at a... a, a, a zebra crossing you know and an old lady would go across oh 10 points you know? <laughs> and he had yeah. no idea where yeah. it came from it was just in the air at the time everybody was saying it it was just this sort of sick joke i don't like there's no way my mum's <laughs> i know my mum well enough to know she hasn't seen death race 2000 it was just yeah, part of saying. the world at the time you know they was just everybody everybody knew what it meant you know but uh for those that don't maybe we'll, we ought to explain what we're yeah, gibbering about because there's yeah. gonna be some people think well they're on about 10 points but um the the the, 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 the idea of the film is it's completely Completely nuts, all right? I mean, this is one of those films where you go into it and yes, you'll see some satire and you'll have like, the best, you know, 80 odd minutes of your life, but don't think about it. If you think about it, it falls apart immediately. The, the idea is that in the year 2000, as the title would suggest, we've got the latest in the transcontinental road race, which is where a group of uh, racing drivers race from. I think they're going from east to west. Yes, because they end up in New Los Angeles, don't they? they go, so they're going from east to west. But. The winner is not necessarily the person who gets there first or even alive in this case, but it's the person who scores the most points. You score points by running over innocent civilians. And they, they do point it out at one point that women get 10 points more than men in all age brackets. Teenagers are now worth 40 points. So you young people, you know, you're valued, but you're not as valued as very small people. If you're under 12, you get 70 points, which leads to one of the greatest lines in cinema history when uh, one of the drivers, Nero the hero, he's closing in on a picnicking family and his co-driver says, if they scatter, go for the baby and mother. <laughs> absolutely brilliant line. Anyone over 75, you get 100 points for them. So, uh, so yes, yeah, so you score points depending on how many people you kill and the winner is a sort of combination of who gets there first plus their points and um, this is all sort of set in a, a, against a backdrop of a fascist america 
where the um, church and state have been united into one. And um, it all happened after a, an economic crash, the crash of 79, which, you know, so for those of us who've lived through several economic crashes in our lives, is always quite worrying. But, um, but yeah, so there's been this crash of 79. There have been a military coup. The bipartisan party has taken over with Mr. President, who is as <laughs> much a, a sort of media figure as the hero of the piece, uh, Frankenstein, the star driver, played by David Carradine. And it's very similar in that respect to Rollerball because it is about this one individual who has sort of become this media figure and become a great... Um, he's got his own fan club yeah. who who offer up sacrifices to club. him. You know, there's a, there's a marvellous scene. And it's not, it's, you know, it's just one of those scenes where it's not silly or funny. It's actually really touching where he meets one of his fan club members who's been chosen to just stand in the road and be run over by him. It sounds ridiculous, but it's so well done. You know, it, it, where she's sort of saying to him, it's not about love, it's not about sex. It's just, this is what, we, you know, this is what we do. You know, we, we're, we're your fans. We love you. It's not about a physical thing. We just love you. We want to make you happy so you can run us over and score, you know, however many points. It's kind of tragic, but really quite moving as well. It's quite, a, yeah, it's like a weird fanaticism, isn't it? Because like this, it's almost like religious for this fan group because it is yeah they've all got the uniforms haven't they with their the f's on them you know and the way they line up along the side of the road to watch this poor girl get mown down which of course frankenstein obliges and when he's um, when his co-driver objects he just said it's what she would have wanted you know? <laughs> so, so he's, he's an anti-hero rather than a hero but yes they've got this almost you know when, when, when they start lining up there's almost like um organ music playing on the soundtrack yeah. because it's become this cult that they sort of worship Frankenstein and are so fanatical they'll die for him which is really mad I wanted to meet you Mr. Frankenstein I wanted you to know who I am so it would have meaning I don't understand so what would have meaning we love you Mr. Frankenstein I know just saying it doesn't mean much why do you love me because I kill people Scoring isn't killing, Mr. Frankenstein. It's part of the race. You're a national hero, and we want you to know we're with you 100%. I mean, the whole film is mad, isn't it? Oh, I mean, God, it's, it's, I think it's it's just like the cartoonishness to it as well, because obviously the first thing I was thinking about was like wacky races. <laughs> and like, you've got the very stylized cars. Everyone's like a certain character. You've got like the German car. You've got, um, what other ones have we got in there? There's well, like, you've, got, you've got Frankenstein, who's David Carradine. You know, he's yeah, the guy fantastic. that survived so many crashes and been rebuilt, supposedly. In fact, what they're doing is every time Frankenstein dies, they wheel out another one. So he's just the latest Frankenstein. He's got a few guards to prove it but that's about all you've got you've got the marvelous machine gun joe viterbo played by uh, sylvester stallone very uh, early in his career and he is magnificent he's just kind of this old style italian gangster who's absolutely insane throughout they're all completely <laughs> nuts all of them but I, I i love machine gun joe he's just so deranged he's got a brilliant line where he calls some um calls his someone a baked potato doesn't he? that's right yeah you're a baked potato <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but you, then you got uh, you got calamity jane kelly mary warrenoff who's you know this sort of cowgirl type figure you've got the one you mentioned earlier matilda the hun roberta collins and her cry of blitzkrieg every time oh, she God, runs yeah. someone oh she uh, you know it's one of those films where you think you think it, I mean, they have remade it, sadly, but if they remade it now, they probably wouldn't have, you know, sort of Nazis in it driving around in, in, in buzz bombs. You know, it, it's kind of, it is one of those, you kind of watch it, watch it you think, really? <laughs> you know, yeah. yeah. That, that joke isn't funny It's not funny, funny anymore. anymore. It? No, it doesn't, it doesn't travel well. <laughs> You've also got Nero, the hero, who's a bit boring. He's Martin Cove. He's the first one to get <laughs> wiped out and he's uh, described as a has-been. You know, he's, um, but yeah, you've got these cartoonish characters and Wacky Races is a perfect, perfect analogy for it. I mean, I must admit that when I first saw it, I did think this is wacky races with blood, isn't it? I mean, this is exactly yeah. what it is. And in, um, in in nightmare movies, Kim Newman very, very aptly described it. It's the closest real movies have come to Chuck Jones's Roadrunner cartoons. Oh, and of you course, even, yeah. You even get a Roadrunner gag 
with the, you know, when they try and lure one of the, they, at least Matilda, isn't it? They try to lure off the road and they put yeah. a fake, oh, a fake tunnel, <laughs> which is just a cardboard flat with a sort of black bit on it. And oh, he's like, that's touch. the fake tunnel that she goes through and goes over a cliff, you know? So he, he, they even nick the jokes from Roadrunner, which is marvellous. Yeah. And again, this guy, this kind of thing's been done again, and again, like I, I was thinking of Rat Race as well. Like, um, yes. Yeah. Because yep. that's the same sort of thing. But there's something about having all of these, like these stylized cars and these different characters that makes it really entertaining. And it's, and it's clearly entertainment. They've, everyone's oh, yes. like a different character. What's so entertaining about it is he's directed, written and directed by Paul Bartel, who, you know, is a great director anyway. But what's, what I always I admire so much is that he knows it's absurd. He patently knows it's absurd, and yet he treats it completely seriously. Mm. This is not. I've seen people describe Death Race 2000 as camp. It's not camp. It is not camp at all. He plays it deadly seriously. The humour comes out of the fact that this deadly seriousness is just so absurd. There's just so much sort of craziness going on in this world. But he doesn't joke about it. It's taken terribly seriously. And he has points to make. He has um, satirical points to make pretty much the same points as, as rollerball in fact yeah but it's like over the it's like it's in your face it's over it the top satire and yeah. it, it made me think like both of these films made me think of robocop and sort of verhoven's sort of style as well yes. it's the same sort of thing like you're talking about the corporations and the consumerism and you're also sort of like you're doing you've got in the face adverts this has the um announcers yep. which that's right the most yep. ridiculous things and you've got adverts <laughs> for stuff all of that i think really like aids it in the message it's getting across that of course. this kind of society could happen. So yeah, of watch and, out. You know- of course, he's taken a swipe at the media as well. It's one of the mm. many things that the film is taking aim at. So you have got these vacuous television hosts. You know, you got the woman who's everybody's her, my close personal friend. You know, and she's everybody she meets, even if she's only met them for a few seconds, he's my close personal friend. And you've got this guy who deadpans through all his presentations. He's supposed to be, you know, he's commentating on this incredible race. And yeah, his whole commentary is like this. And then you've got the opposite <laughs> end of the scale. You've got you've got Junior, who um you know, played by the real Don Steele, who's quite possibly the most irritating man in the entire film. And, uh, <laughs> oh, without you know, doubt. But these are all sort of larger than life versions of what people were seeing on American television at the time. So it's very much an attack on the media. You get that one moment where uh, Matilda is killed when she's lured off the cliff. And the presenters start talking about the um, the resistance, who we'll talk about in a second, I guess, um, that they've killed her. And then suddenly the message comes through, no, 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 we got that wrong. She's just scored a fantastic score. Yeah, of course she has. <laughs> she just killed herself and a driver, so she got the points for those. But, but you know, they they, they blatantly lie to the, to the viewers, which, again, you know, in certainly in the last few years, we've become very used to that, sadly. But, you know, this is a film that was taking that apart back in 1975. I love the, the manic energy that Junior brings to it. He's kind of the, the stand-in for the audience because we don't see a great deal, of, unlike yeah. Rollerball, where we have crowds gathered yes, and we see yeah. how the public is loving the death sport. Uh, I feel like Don Steele's there to to basically take the place of that and just like show you how crazy everyone is for for the violence. That yeah. mad excitement! It's a yeah. great kill! It's that a brilliant kill! kill. You know? And he's just so over the top, isn't he? About everything, he's wonderful. I think he says about the first kill, he's like absolutely no pain right. to, the, to the guy. Or something like that. You just yeah. seen him get cut in That's half right. by yeah. the crotch. Yeah, great by pains Stallone. to point out that you know no one has suffered yeah. from it. Oh, you've just killed him! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. It's hilarious, and, and and furthermore, they bring in the widow later. Oh, that's marvelous! Crying yeah. on screen because yeah. they're going to give her all these things, aren't they? Like a house and a car and stuff like that. Because you know her husband was the first victim, and it's like, yeah, that that that'll ease her pain. Nice work, guys. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> a nice big house to live in on yeah, your own. Exactly. <laughs> So, so they've got all of this stuff going on and sort of like the entertainment stuff and then how they're sort of manipulating them with the media. But then you've got the resistance. But for me, the resistance didn't seem very effective. They, they, they seem a bit useless. incompetent, don't they? Yeah. They're useless. They, I mean, <laughs> again, I think it's a bit of um, 
a, a, a bit of a satire. I think he's taking aim at the 60s counterculture, which, of course, back then was still around. You know, those guys were still about. You know, I'm an old hippie. They're my people. I'm not going to attack them. But they didn't really do very much in the end. They were, they were full of talk and full of brave ideas and stuff, but nothing really got changed. And when you look at the resistance, apart from Harriet Medin, who plays Thomasina Payne, who's the, the aged leader, who I, I suspect is named after Thomas Payne, whose pamphlets had, you know, inspired the War of Independence in the first place. Apart from her, they're all very young and they're all long hairs and they're all sort of, you know, sort of firebrand visionaries who haven't got a clue. There's a marvellous scene where they're setting up a barricade because they're going to ambush one of the drivers <laughs> and they sort of, they, they, they say, you know, oh, look at the great big hole we've left in there. And they're looking through the hole and the car's coming from the other direction. It comes from behind them and runs them over. That's they different. hadn't planned that far ahead, you know, and they are, they are absolutely useless. They managed to kill a few of the drivers but I think that's just more by luck than judgments, you know. It's Frankenstein does much more for the resistance than the resistance manages to do. By the end, most of them are dead. Sure. And I love, the, and I love the fact that they're, they're doing all this work, and they don't even get the um, don't even get the credit for it because the government blames the French, the treacherous French, because re- <laughs> because remember. Sabotage is a French word, as they point out. <laughs> so, so they're not even getting the recognition for it. And there's this frustration that they do this air attack at one point, and the media says it was the French Air Force attacking. <laughs> it's just ludicrous. So, you know, they're completely useless, and they're not even getting the media coverage that I'm hoping for. They're, they're really funny, the resistance in this. I love them. Yeah, they don't have a good time. And again, it's... it's- it's Roadrunner stuff. It is Roadrunner stuff. Are, they yeah. are Wiley Coyote all over. Their successes and their failures. Exactly. Successes by the, accident yeah. and failures by incompetence. That's pure Wiley Coyote. But again, you know, there's that little air of, um, that little undercurrent of satire in there. You know, that we had great dreams in the late 60s that never came true because people got sidetracked. You know, he could have, we could have changed the world in the 1960s. No one did because, you know, there were other things and other drugs to take, so it didn't happen. So, uh, so yeah, so I think, you know, Paul Bartel, far too smart not to have done that, I think. You know, in 1974, I think it was shot, 75 release. They were still, that was still very current, and that was still smarting for people of Bartel's generation, I think, you know, who were very politically committed that they didn't succeed in anything. So, yeah, of course he, of course he turned it into satire. So he's in, he's envisaging a real, a real nightmare monster in the president, then Mr. President. Absolutely, who's yeah. Successfully taken. He's over. the worst of every worst American president we've ever seen. You know, he is, you know, and like I say, they, they've they, they've merged um, state and church, which you know the, the Constitution very expressly forbids, but they managed to, and he, he's worshipped like a god. You know, he has become these sort of the ultimate dictator you know he's seen as this benign figure who we know next to nothing about we know next to nothing about him even by the end we know nothing and you know he's just this mysterious figure who everybody just blindly worships because he gives them the road race once a year and he loves his children he loves his children he refers to the population as his children doesn't he yeah it's um it's very creepy. He's actually quite a creepy character in what is meant to be quite a funny film. He's actually quite sinister. I, I have to say, I loved all of that stuff. Again, this is a film I hadn't seen. Um, Where have you I been? Where knew, have you been? I know. You are having the best time this series, Matt. <laughs> it's been a good week for me, yeah. But I thought I knew what I was getting when it started. It, I, You know, like you said, yeah, 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 sure. this is silly. This is a very silly, funny film. Um, but all of that stuff with Mr. President was great, mainly, mainly because it, it absolutely doesn't need to be there. This film works as a as a very silly, wacky, comedy, violent race film. The dystopian stuff that's just basically wedged in because it's clearly of interest to Paul Bartel. Exactly. It, it's great it and it worked. worked. And that's the beauty of the film, that if you want to see it as a bloodstained, wacky racist, go ahead. That's great. You, you'll still enjoy it and you'll have, you know, you'll have an hour and a half so much fun. It's great. If you then start spotting the these, you know, sort of satirical edges to it. Excellent seat see for that as well. It works on all levels. You know, it's a film that it doesn't matter how you watch. Sometimes I'll watch it and I'm, I'm sitting there, you know, stroking my chin. Oh, yes, oh, I can see that in the world. And other times I'll sit there going, you know, shouting Blitzkrieg, you know, just sort of, <laughs> like, waiting for the next person to, to meet their sticky end, which, of course, does raise a question about, you know, what I said earlier about the absurdity of it. Mm. Why are people still out on the streets when they know they're coming? I mean, <laughs> they do make a point of this at one point, don't they? That, you know, that there aren't many people on the street this year. And it's like, yeah, because they bloody learned, mate. You know, yeah. yeah. But the way the they, they frame it almost as if it's like a sort of 
a, a, a patriotic duty to go out on the streets and risk your life. Why are those workmen still putting up signs and things? Why, <laughs> take a day off and go to the hills, you know, and don't go out. The guy, the guy who's fishing, who <laughs> yeah. seems only dimly aware of, of the race but, and, and gets uh, gets Joe confused with Frankenstein. <laughs> but he's clearly aware of the concept oh, of, course, of the race knows, and yeah. he doesn't run for the but hills. He's just not... You're not bright enough to deal with it. And I think my three favourite characters in it are the Chicken Gang. <laughs> it was yeah. just, just the stupidest people in 70s cinema. <laughs> They're going to go and play it's like, chicken. What are, they doing? what are they doing? Fantastic. But, you know, you can see it as this hilariously silly film. But like I say, it has got a kind of a point to it as well, several points to it, in fact. And that's what makes it so marvellous. Yeah, because like we talked about, like... Um... The the resistance is coming is is pretty incompetent, but yes. it seems like Frankenstein he's he's trying to take it down from within. That's as well, right, which yes. is like revealed as it goes on, and he's this fantastic anti-hero because throughout it he's doing these horrendous things, but you still quite you still quite yeah. like him, like still kind of rooting anyway. for him. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you don't want him to get caught by the resistance. You don't care about the others, blow them up, that's fine. But you know this is David Carradine. You don't want him to be blown up. This is you know he's too cool for that. And then of course at the end, now our um, admiration for him is rewarded by you know the fact that yeah you know he's uh he's you know he's an all right guy and you know the one of the great visual puns in there the hand grenade i mean it's literally <laughs> a, a hand with a grenade in it which um yeah, it is one of the great visual puns and it's just marvelous so, so uh, why he would be driving around bumpy roads with his hand <laughs> on the steering wheel with his grenade in it that could go off at any moment you know you gotta admire his, his, his dedication to the cause yeah, that's one thing I couldn't quite get over. I was like, at any time you could just just go off and then that's the end yeah. of it. That's the end of Frankenstein. He's gone. But you, but you know the only reason it's there is because Paul Bartel thought, oh, hand grenade. There's hand a joke. Grenade, and that's yeah. the only reason it's Because it's not even like he uses it to kill the president. He sort of, he comes off, doesn't he? And who does he, does he blow up Joe with it? He blows somebody up with it. And it's not even actually used at the end to kill the presidents. It's, um, so yeah, it's just, it was just this joke. I'm sure that Paul Bartel was hanging out with some of his mates one day. Somebody made a hand grenade gag and he thought, oh, I'm having that. And, you know, <laughs> and, the, and it works. It's brilliant. <laughs> it's just so good. Frankenstein! Frankenstein the legend! Frankenstein the indestructible! Sole survivor of the Titanic pileup of 95! Only two-time winner of the transcontinental road race! Frankenstein! Ripped up, wiped out, battered, shattered, creamed and reamed! A dancer on the brink of death! Frankenstein! Who lost a leg in 98, an arm in 99! With half a face and half a chest and all the guts in the world, he's back. God only knows what he looks like under that mask, but he is back. In the name of Mr. President, America loves you, Frankenstein. I mean, we also talked about like uh, if we if rollerball was a real sport, would we mm -hmm. give it a go? I mean, if Death Race 2000 was a sport. <laughs> How, do you reckon, how many points do you reckon you'd rack up? I, I mean, I can't drive, so I, I wouldn't get off the starting line, <laughs> oh, to, no. to be I mean, honest. You, you might score loads of points then if you just... Just go, I, I would I would be a little, little bit like Joe backing up and running over his own pit crew, but he does it deliberately. I'd just be in the wrong gear and just run people over. You, know? you could uh, you could be a navigator. I'd be a navigator. Yeah, I think I'd be quite good as a navigator. But I think you know the navigators, if we notice, they are the opposite sex. So I'd have to be with Matilda or Calamity Jane. Which you know, would that be such a bad thing? Probably not. I think I would survive that. But you know, yeah, that way, run him over, run her over. That would be great. So, oh, it'd be really good, wouldn't it, for that list you've got we've all got it don't deny that you haven't got it we've all got a list in our heads of all the people that we'd like to bring bad things to that's the day that you would go out with that list. trust me as you get older that list gets extraordinarily long but uh, you would be the one day where you go out and make that list come true you know be marvelous but no i don't think i'd be very good at the death race because um yeah, I'm just. I'd be to be honest. I'd be too busy looking at the scenery. You know, whenever I'm in a car, I'm being driven about. I'm I'm far too busy looking out the window because there's far more interesting things to do out there than you know there are in here. So I'd be, I'd be hopeless. But you wouldn't go out. You wouldn't go out fishing. Right? Oh, good God! I I, I, I mean, I, I'd be in more lockdown than I'm in now. To be honest, I never leave the house while the death race was on. But um, yeah, no, it, it's um, it, it has 
credibility problems with the plot, but like I say, don't worry about that because it really doesn't matter. It doesn't matter one little bit. I, I always get hung up on, you know, so all the plot doesn't make sense. Oh, no, no, but not with Death Race 2000. Who cares? Yeah, there, there are idiots roaming the streets on Death Race Day. Yeah, why wouldn't you? You know, of course you would. So, And it was interesting that they, they kind of remade this sort of as a film called Car Quake, which had also got David Carradine in it, but it's not science fiction. It's not set in the future. It's just a car chase across America, a bit like the Gumball Rally oh, and nice. a bit like films like that. And you say nice, but when you watch it, you think, okay. oh, you know, yeah, David Carradine's in it. There's lots of cool car chases, but it's just a film about cars driving across America. And it was what they bought into this, you know, the whole point scoring system, the the ludicrous cars. The cars are magnificently stupid. It, all of that sort of weirdness, the surrealism and the, the wackiness is what made the film what it is. When you see Car Quake, you think, yeah, this is a kind of normalised Death Race 2000. You realise just how much Paul Bartel brought to it. Yeah, because there was a um, there was a series on sci-fi, I think not that long ago, called Blood Drive. Oh, and right. That, that was doing like a similar kind of Death Race 2000 thing but all of the cars were powered by like blood so they had to like kill people and they had to refill their tanks with blood well there were remakes of course there was uh, jason statham was in the first one wasn't he and then there were two sequels to that and then there was um death race 2050 which was the official remake which was sanctioned by roger corman but I mean, I don't have to tell you that they're rubbish, but, you know, they, they, they are. It's just this one has... It, this is one of those films, like Rollerball, it was the right film at the right time. And it's just everything about it looks right and feels right. I think even if you'd made it five years later in 1980, it wouldn't have been quite the same film. There's just something about... There was something in the air in the mid-70s that led to these films and gave them the look and the atmosphere and the sort of the weird off-kilter feel that these two films have exactly and i love the sort of like the dystopian society they've created around it and just like how how similar the concepts are at like uh, that they are in rollerball as well yeah. it's just like it just totally works doesn't it oh cool and it works again because in death race 2000 they don't tell us too much we don't have enough to pick apart you know you can pick apart the, i mean even my beloved blade runner i, I adore blade runner second greatest film ever made all the rest of it but Oh, what's I, the first? 2001. Oh, Always and forever, 2001. Your top two are the best, Kev. Fantastic. They're the best films ever made. Trust me. Trust me. I will fight anyone who, who <laughs> argues on this one. But, um, you know, I watch Blade Run. I think, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a masterpiece. It's magnificent. And they built all those massive skyscrapers on, a, on an earthquake fault line. Really? I mean, you know, the rest of it is so brilliantly worked out. It's little things like that that I think, oh, that doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? <laughs> but, you know, in this film, they don't give us enough of that background for us to pick it apart. They give us just enough to make it feel like it's real, but without too many details that we can then sit and obsess over and say, oh, no, that wouldn't have worked. Oh, that wouldn't have worked. You know, it's just enough to keep us engaged. And that's the beauty of it. It's so streamlined. that nowadays we get everything handed to us on a plate. We get epic backstories before we even get to the action. I think of, you know, the, 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 the Rob Zombie remake of Halloween, which spent half the film telling us all about, you know, Michael as a child. I don't care. I want to see Michael getting out there stabbing people. Get on with it. And we get too much of that. And this is not what they did in the 70s. They didn't worry about that stuff. I mean, you know, rollerball starts with a rollerball game. There's no setup. There's, we, no one's coming to tell you what this game is or what the world is. You're just going to watch rollerball and pick it up as you go along. Death Race 2000, you get these sort of idiots popping up, these television presenters popping up to fill in the gaps a little bit. But most of the time, you're left to your own devices again. And I think maybe that's why these films, you know, they last the test of time and stand the test of time because they don't patronise their audience. Mm. and it's just good filmmaking isn't it it's just it? good because filmmaking good storytelling yeah yeah you don't need because if you if you overload it on exposition then you're not telling the story the right way it's like it's a visual medium you need to like get to the meat and bones of it and then exactly. people can unravel it as you well, go and i think that's what's the joy about science fiction as well like yes good science fiction doesn't tell you all of the science exactly. necessarily no. it'll give you enough do. to understand it some films do and they're the ones that we just can't be doing with you know it's um i, I didn't really like ad astra because they spent an awful lot of time explaining the science and then the rest of the time completely contradicting it and i think if you hadn't told me what the science was and just gone out there and done this i wouldn't have questioned what the science was 
just go and do it. Just just give us a good space story. I don't care how you get there, and I don't care how gravity works, and I don't, you know, well, I do, but I'll read a book for that. I don't need to see that in a, in a film, you know? <laughs> and I don't need to know too much about the corporate wars. I just need to know that they happened. It's just, it's just good background texture for the story. Had they gone off into a sort of, you know, a 10-minute sequence where Jonathan goes to zero and learns about the, you know, the, the, the corporate wars, who'd care? It wouldn't add anything to the story. It would be, you know, but nowadays I suspect we'd get a five-minute prologue showing us the corporate wars before we'd actually got to the first game of Rollerball, you know, and that's not what we're (laughs) there for. We're we're here to see Rollerball. We want to see a game. We're here to see Death Race 2000. We want to see the cars. And so, you know, they get into it very, very quickly, which is just marvellous. Rant over. We can get back to the point now. (laughs) (laughs) That background, that backstory that's just hinted at again, yeah, like the the world crash of 1979, very similar to the corporate wars. Not to to drag Dune into every conversation, but it's very... very but Larry and Jihad. That's isn't right. It? It's, yeah, uh, as as was in the earlier books. It's this mysterious event. Even having read uh, the books many times, I don't know what the but Larry and Jihad actually was. It was just something that exactly. happened in the past. Yeah. I don't actually care. I know it had a big impact on on the universe that we're seeing now. That's enough. That's why I never went and read any of the prequel novels to it because I don't care. It doesn't matter. It's texture. It's background texture. We don't need to know all of the texture we just need it to be there and these films are perfect examples of that just give us what we need and then move on to the good stuff it's such a great technique isn't it texture is such a good word because it really is it really does add that and it it doesn't talk down to the audience that way either you know i I do get fed up of watching films of all genres where everything grinds to a halt for 10 minutes while everybody explains the plot to me you know you know i've worked it out and if people can't work it out well sorry don't pander to them you know, see if they'll come back again. Give them something else to watch and they might love it enough to come back and watch it again a few years down the road and they might get it this time. Most people will get it. You don't have to keep delivering things to us on a, on a, on a plate, you know? What we got here is a race, a sporting event. Not some kind of daredevil stunt. I want some kind of protection. You should have given us an escort right after Nero got it. Come on, Joe, score in the escort, wouldn't you, hey, You want to zip your lip, Myra? Huh? Are you going to cover me or not? Look, Mr. Viterbo, if you're afraid to go on with the race, why don't you quit? You're calling me a turkey? If you ask me, you're all just making excuses for poor drive. Poor drive! Well, we talked earlier, didn't we, about the, um, the hand grenade, which was, this was Frankenstein's plan. And in fairness, it seems like his only plan. This was all he had was he was going to shake hands with the president. And then there's this ludicrous accident where he loses his hand and it blows up and all the rest of it. So they have to come up with a, a new ending. And... <laughs> the way they do it, and again, go, go, go pause now if, if you haven't seen it. If, if you haven't seen it, stop listening to this dribble. Go and watch the bloody <laughs> yeah. thing. Go trust watch me, the film. you know. Don't listen to me. Just go watch it. But at the end, they it turns out that the Frankenstein that goes up to greet the president is in fact his co-driver Annie. I'm not entirely sure I buy this bit because that is quite clearly Simone Griffith in that in that costume. That is no longer David David Carradine. David Carradine was not built like that. And anybody who thinks that that's a man walking up those steps is is, is blind, frankly, you know. But it works. It works because you know she gets shot by her own mother because you know she thinks. She thinks she's still Frank. Her mum doesn't recognise her, it's her. Okay, but, you know, we'll buy that, we'll buy that. And then um, and then Frankenstein just basically just does what he's done all the time, drives his car into it. He then becomes president and makes all these wonderful claims about what he's going to do, about moving the capital back to New Los Angeles and doing this and doing that and doing the other. And the road race is over and all the rest of it. But then Junior Bonner pops up being irritating. You know, so <laughs> the people want the road race. The people want the road race. So, you know, old, old habits die hard. He runs him over. And so, you know, he, <laughs> even in his wedding car, as he's going off on his honeymoon, he can't quite help himself and he runs over Junior Bonner. At which point the entire audience just applauds and cheers. And certainly that's when I've seen it in cinemas, people go nuts at that bit because they've all been absolutely annoyed to the back teeth by bloody Junior Bonner and just seen him being run over. He's like, yes, marvellous. But, you know, it does suggest at the end, and it's quite bleak in a way for a film that's been so funny, it does sort of suggest that maybe nothing's going to change. Yeah, you know, I maybe think that's the thing, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, the people want the road race. You know, that's the point. You know, I think, I think Junior Bonner even actually says that to him. You know, people want this. You can't deny them this. So as a president, is he going to risk alienating his own people by saying we're not going to do this anymore or is he just going to cave in and it's a bit like rollerball at the end of rollerball he hasn't won rollerball's still there and rollerball will still be played 
and he'll meet some horrible death at some point. They'll they'll give up on that idea of he's got to die on the track as a, a, a thing. So both films sort of end on this fairly bleak point where actually the heroes haven't really achieved what they wanted to do because in Death Race 2000, he's very possibly become the thing that he didn't want to be. And certainly in Rollerball, he's not... He hasn't achieved anything. You know, Rollerball still exists. The corporation still exists. All he's done is, you know, sort of this bloody-minded sort of independence. You know, he stuck two fingers up to Bartholomew and that's all he's achieved, which is really bleak. And that's kind of what we've found so far with dystopian like films. Like, I can't think of any so far that we've had that have had like a really uplifting ending where everything's fine. I mean, the only one well things to come didn't even have a very good up, it did, it didn't ending, it did it? sort of no. left it on a on a, a sort of you know a, a not quite sure how things are going to go i'd suggest that maybe maybe mad max beyond thunderdome hinted at something you know when we see those final shots of sydney and the tribe have made it to sydney and they're now repopulating sydney there's a glimmer of hope at the end of that, which, of course, he took away from us in Fury Road, where, you know, sort of like, <laughs> you know, the world is still going to shit and it's all horrible and nothing's ever going to change. But, you know, there is and there's hope again, at the, I think, at the end of Mad Max 2, perhaps. And maybe even at, in Children of Men, I think there's a glimmer. I don't think you get films where the dystopia is overthrown, necessarily. I'm sure there are a few. I mean, we might make reference to the other version of Dune, which attempts that, where you've got this sort of planet, which is like a dystopia, you know, it's a hellhole, it's a horrible hellhole, and then it rains. Oh, come on. You know, <laughs> please, honestly, Denny Villeneuve, if you're listening, you're not, but if you are, please, please don't don't screw up the ending of part two like that. Please, please, please. I don't that, think he's going to be going with the rain. Anything. That scarred me back in 1984, and I, I've still not recovered from that. But, you know, that, that tries to offer a glimpse of, of change, but they never work, I don't think. You know, if you've got a dystopia, something massive has got to happen to overthrow it. And... That's a whole other film. But, I mean, that that massive thing, I guess, does happen at the end of Death Race. I think it's interesting that both of these films end suddenly. Um, it's, it's a more kind of, I think it's a bit more, uh, how to put it, like uh, delicately thought out in Rollerball's ending. Um, but there's, there's something in the way Death Race 2000 ends at breakneck speed, that last scene. Because, and I think it's maybe something about the way that Frankenstein's coming in and making all these sweeping changes that, as we were just discussing, might not really have any impact. I think there might be something in the way that's then it's just like a three minute scene at breakneck speed. It feels a little bit tacked on, but it works. It feels like, it, oh, we, you know, we, we need something to finish the film. Let's do this. And, you know, as, as geniuses like Paul Bartel often do, they can pull something out of the hat on the spur of the moment, and you came up with this this fantastic ending, which leaves you ambiguous, you're not sure, you know, has it all been worth it? You know, certainly it's not as bleak as Rollerball. That that final freeze frame in Rollerball is just one of those moments that sears onto your brain, you know, and you, you'll never shake it now you've seen the film. You'll never shake that final freeze frame of just Jonathan's defiance at the end. But, you know, that thought that it's all for nothing, possibly, you know, it's... Uh, well, that cheery note. Good night, children. I hope you sleep well. Don't have nightmares. But, uh, <laughs> but that's what dystopias are meant to do. They're meant to give you nightmares. You know, they're meant to make you think: How would I cope in this? How would I? How w- would I have been Jonathan E? Or would I have been Mr. Bartholomew? I suspect I'd have been Moon Pie, only not as good looking. I'd have been, you know, sort of oh. the, the, the one that just sort of, you know, dicks about a bit and then gets killed. So, you know, I suspect that would have been me. But you know, it's meant to frighten you. It's meant to make you go away and think. You know, wow, you know, is there any hope? They are despairing films, dystopias, but, you know, it's like, as well as being an old goth, I was an, an old hippie, I was an old goth, so I quite kind of like a bit of despair occasionally, <laughs> so I'm, I'm quite happy with that, you know. Yeah, I think you need it, you need to, it needs you, you need to sort of wake up to some of these things every once in a while. And it might not be pretty. It might be nope. like quite ugly and horrendous to look at, like in Rollerball in the, yes. in the final scene. But yep. you need a bit of that. You need a bit of sort of like shock oh, value. Definitely. Yeah, you, you can't have, you know, it can't all be fun. It can't all be, you know, it can't all be Star Wars. You know, it's got, there's, got to be, <laughs> there's got to be some bleakness in there as well. And that's, the, the, these are the, per- and you know, I think, they're kind of interesting films in that sense, actually, thinking about it. that they Certainly, um, Rollerball was probably the last really good, serious film before Star Wars. 
Ah, interesting. There was Logan's Run, but I don't rate Logan's Run at all, to be honest, but I'm not a fan of it. But, <laughs> well, we're doing that later in the series, Kev, so you yeah, might want luck. to skip for that one. Good luck. I won't, I won't be listening to that one. <laughs> <laughs> no, I will, of course. I'll be, there. I'll be listening to it in the theatre and shouting at the speakers. Bloody idiots, you know what you're talking about. But, um, so I didn't really count that one as much, but Rollerball might be the last big, serious Hollywood film. I mean, Death Race 2000 is a great film, but it's not you know, a serious film. So I wonder, was it the big, last big studio serious science fiction film before Star Wars came along and changed everything, for better or for worse? You know, it's up to you to decide. But, you know, was it the last one, perhaps? I think it probably was. Can't think of much else that came out afterwards. That's really interesting. And yeah, well, I'm sure we'll see as we sort of like go on um, the journey what sort of like, what the dystopian films were sort of like post 1975 and yes sort of, yeah yeah and how did they change they because you know star wars brought in this kind of optimism you know and and you know that they, they, i'm trying to think when the next big dystopia would have been probably probably would have been blade runner you know i think it possibly would i can't think of anything big between yeah because that was the big mainstream one wasn't that's it? right yeah I think there were sort of, you know, smaller ones. There was uh, there was Death Sport, which was supposed to be notionally a sequel to Death Race 2000, but actually hadn't got anything to do with it at all. It was just David Carradine and, and Roger Corman. They just said it was a sequel, but it got nothing to do with it whatsoever. But they got things like that, but they were little films. They were smaller, low-budget films. But I can't think of a big mainstream Hollywood film that came out between Rollerball and Blade Runner. I'm sure there are loads of people screaming at me now, sort of, you idiot, you've forgotten <laughs> this. But, you know, yeah, and it does feel like Star Wars sort of swept that away. A little bit because it went more for optimism and you know it was more i use the word pantomime which um yes i can hear them building the wicker man as soon as i said pantomime in, in reference to star wars they're gonna they're gonna burn me in a wicker man later but it has got that kind of that kind yeah. of feel to it it's much more of a sort of upbeat jolly although you know it's got the highest death toll of any film ever made when you think about it you know, an, an entire planet Old is planet, destroyed at yeah, one point. Course. You know, more people die in the course of Star Wars than in any other film ever made. But it's got this sort of optimism and this sort of uplifting quality to it, which doesn't sit well with dystopias. So maybe they had to wait for Star Wars to sort of settle a bit before they could come back to it. And it's got less of the sort of uh, the traditional sort of sci-fi what if message to it. Like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's no like warning of things to come. It's it's just it's there it's, for the entertainment, isn't it's it? It's Lord of the Rings. It's Lord of the Rings in space. It's a fantasy. I, I, it's one of those things that on my website. I call it science fiction because I've got into so much trouble calling it fantasy. But it is actually a fantasy film. Just because it's got spaceships in it doesn't make it science fiction any more than having horses in it makes it a western. It's just you know, <laughs> but it is a fantasy film. And you know, on that level, it works. It did you know, it works as a. You know, you know, as a science fiction fan, I wasn't entirely keen on it because it was sweeping away films like Rollerball. You know, th those films that I really wanted to see weren't being made now. Everybody was just ripping off until Alien came along and I was much happier then. So. <laughs> <laughs> and, and speaking of films which um, like you really want to see and, and you have seen, are there any other sort of like dystopian films um, you think we, we should cover in the series or anything that like we might, might have missed? Anything that sort of springs to mind? Well, I would, I mean, if you don't do Children of Men, there's something horribly wrong with you. I mean, Children of Men is another masterpiece. That's, you know, that may May or, may or may not be my third favourite film, but it is certainly up there in my top ten. It's a magnificent film. And what a dystopia that is. You know, that's 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 a dystopia that's the day after tomorrow. You know, Rollerball and Death Race 2000 are a little bit further in the future, but Children of Men, you can kind of see that happening any day now. So that really definitely needs needs covering. That's a remarkable film. I would hope you're doing the Mad Max films, if you haven't done already, because they're, you know... <laughs> yeah, I, mean, they, I mean, they are, you know, sort of dystopia to the nth degree, aren't they? And they, they, they sort of, the, in a way, they, they've got the same DNA as Death Race 2000. You know, they, they would make a good... A, a good full day's viewing. Start with Death Race 2000, then do the Mad Max quadrilogy as it is now. Is it quadrilogy for four quartets? And watch those. And, and honestly, you'll have the best day of your life. Well, I think that about wraps up our chat on Rollerball and Death Race 2000. Kev, it has been an absolute pleasure having oh, it's, you It's on. been my pleasure. It's been really great fun to talk to you guys and to talk about two such you know, marvellous films as well. And, and really, I hope, I hope halfway through, my hope with these things is that someone is listening to this and actually stops listening to us and goes and watches the film. So, you know, if anybody's done that, please let us know on, on social media that you went to see it because of this, because I'd love more people to see these films. They're marvellous. And speaking of uh, letting us know on social media, where can people find you oh, on social I'm, media? I'm, all, I'm like a rash. I'm all over the place and hard <laughs> to get rid of. I'm on, I'm, I'm on Facebook. I'm... 
Kevin Lyons has several of us, but I'm the one with um, the, the shot from um, Rear Window. I've got James Stewart looking through a camera lens. That's me. And I've also got my um, EOF FTV page on um, Facebook, also on Twitter. There's one. There is one on Instagram, which I don't use, but do come along and say hello anyway. But come, come and have a chat with me. And um, I, don't, I don't use it much, but I'm always happy to say hello to people and recommend more dystopias, all the ones I've just forgotten. Yeah. And definitely make sure you check out Kev's website, EOFF TV. It's got thousands of reviews i think you've got what 30 almost forty thousand pages of reviews on there it's, no, there's, there's forty thousand entries on the main website but there's about 1100 1200 reviews they go up every day apart from a brief period Fantastic. where i injured myself recently they go up every day but um, sometimes two a day so yeah there's all sorts of stuff on there so do please come and have a look and let me know what you think. It's amazing. There's lots of undiscovered gems for for you guys over there. So yeah, do head over to Kev's website and have thank a little look. Thank you guys. That's, I appreciate that. Thank you. And thank you for thank you for having me. It's been so much fun. Excellent. Cheers, Kev. Thanks again to Kev. Oh, that was great fun talking about those two films. Kev knows his stuff on Rollerball and Death Race 2000, doesn't he? I mean, he's just so knowledgeable about films in general. Just all of the things that he was talking about and the fact that he saw that amazing double bill of yeah. Enter the Dragon and Rollerball. I mean, fantastic. What what an amazing guest to have on the show. Yeah, that was good fun, despite them being some pretty grimy films. I mean, Death Race 2000 is pretty fun. Obviously, we talked about it, but yeah, um, we, <laughs> we made Rollerballs seem a lot more fun even though i was shocked by how uh serious it was i guess yeah i mean we went we've gone pretty deep on the rollerball sort of dystopia but yeah both of these films were great and of course we were talking about dangerous games again in today's episode and in a few episodes time we will again revisit this topic when we look at dangerous mandatory games so yeah that's another one to look out for in the future and this episode kicks off a little string of pretty violent episodes i mean we've seen quite a lot of violence this series dystopias are unpleasant places to be as we have learned and are learning but we've got some particularly violent films coming up Uh, and next week we're going to be looking at enforcing the law so that comes with its fair share of violence as well um what are the two films we've got lined up next week for that james so for next week's episode we are looking at mad max from 1979 what a classic absolutely ecstatic to be looking at that one and of course another great film another cult film dread from 2012 so yeah i think there's a lot of similarities between those two so i'm interested to look at those and look at the sort of the police force in dystopias again yeah we've seen some police officers we've seen lots of police officers cropping up here and there in various roles in these dystopias um but we're really looking at how they just fit into their society and continue to try and enforce the law and i'm really excited as well i love both of these movies proper cult classics i can't believe it's been 10 years since dread already oh god <laughs> madness madness but if you want to get in contact with us before then you can find us on social media we are on twitter facebook instagram we're all over the place if you type in journey through sci-fi into whatever search engine you've got ask jeeves or whatever it is you'll be able to find us and then you can come and join in the conversation Uh, if you want to support the show and you want to get some extra bonus content come and join us on patreon patreon.com slash journey through sci-fi we've got our apes films we looked at the matrix uh we did Santa Claus Conquers the Martians back at Christmas time? You can go back to that one if you want. Yes, lots of great stuff on there. But of course, if you don't want to sign up to Patreon, you can always support the show by giving us a lovely review on whatever podcasting app you use. So if you give us a five-star review, we would absolutely love it. We would love you forever if you give us one of those reviews. And of course, you could. it's always better for the uh, magical algorithms if you put in like a little comment. So when you do that, why don't you tell us what, which of these dangerous games would you want to have a go at? Would you want to do Rollerball or would you want to give Death Race 2000 a go? Let us know. It's neither for me, but I'm, I'm interested to know what, uh, what everyone says <laughs> to that. Anyway, join us next time, folks. Goodbye. Goodbye.